Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Betridge, and I wanted to welcome you to the third webinar of our Investor Readiness Program. These webinars form part of the Investor Readiness Program, which BDO is doing in collaboration with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. In addition to the webinars, we are providing practical masterclasses. Due to the recent disruption of COVID-19, we're working on bringing these to you at a later date, so please stay tuned for further information that will come. Additionally, there will be online resources released during the program period, which will be available on the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development's website. These are documents will assist you in becoming investor ready and navigating the capital raising process, so be sure to look out for them also. Throughout this three-part webinar series, We've been discussing the main key elements of investor readiness, which can be broken up into two parts, the path to becoming investor ready and the navigation of the capital raising process once you are ready. Today's final presenter is Margot Beauchamp, who will be taking us through a real life case study on the investor readiness process. If you missed out on our last two sessions, which covered off on the principles, which will be applied in today's case study and you would like to watch it, you can head to our website and search Investor Readiness. If you have any questions about the program, please reach out to either myself or the Department of Industries and Regional Development. I will now pass you on to our expert in mergers and acquisition, Margot Beauchamp, who has her client, Prue, who's kindly taken the time to discuss her investor readiness journey. Margot is renowned in the mergers and acquisitions space and has advised on over 100 transactions with a combined value of more than $5 billion. Without further ado, I'll now hand you over to Margot and Prue, who are going to talk us through this case study. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just uh, the things that we would like to talk through today is first of all, um, for Prue to tell us a little bit more about herself, uh, for um, Prue to answer the four big questions that you should expect um, from an investor, uh, give a bit more insights into the key documents that you need to help answer those four big questions, uh, what was required for Palgrove to be investor ready, searching and selecting the perfect investor and a post-match summary. Crew, I'd like to say first off, congratulations. It's a wonderful achievement to build a successful business, but truly remarkable achievement to build a business that has the reputation track record, systems and processes to be able to attract an institutional, to, to attract institutional capital. Um, I'm wondering if you can just give a bit, little bit more of a background on yourself. Yes, thanks, Margot, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm General Manager of Palgrove, and Palgrove is a seed stock and commercial cattle business, and we operate through Queensland and, and New South Wales. I, my role there at Palgrove is um, a little bit of a, as general managers do, picking up a lot of pieces. Um, I do risk, uh, I do some of the financials um, for us. I do marketing and HR and, and general, uh, I guess, business management strategy. So that's kind of um, what I am now. What I used to be was, um, you know, husband and wife team, family farmers um, of a business which ran for uh, 30 years. Thanks, Karen. I'd like to start today's discussion by going back to the first webinar where Todd Grover talked about there being four key questions that we must expect an investor to ask. They were, what does your business do? How much money do you want? And what are you going to do with it? What do I get? And when do I get my money back? So what does Palgrove do? Before I get Prue to explain, I'd like again to pick up points from the first webinar so that you have these points front of mind. You will recall in the first webinar that in explaining what you do as a business seeking an investor, you need a compelling argument as to why someone would buy your pen. 
So Prue, what was your compelling vision and story for your business that made New Zealand Super want to buy your pen? Take us on your journey. Thanks, Margot. Yes, it very much was a, a journey and you know we often describe it as a, as a story, a story of um, uh, our business from when we, we first started and that was a, a family business back in 1969 um, with, with feedstock cattle uh, coming on, on to the property. Uh, we then had a family succession where my husband and David and I uh, decided to sort of, you know, um, spec be more specific about what we wanted to do um, and we um, bought out um, our part of the business from, from the family. We introduced and pioneered a new uh, breed of cattle in 2010, which kind of was that, um, you know, we started to think more innovatively, uh, not work on what we had, but sort of started to change our thinking a little bit uh, back in 2010. And then that has led on, as Margot said, to the successful um, partnering with New Zealand Superannuation Fund, um, which happened in 2017. Uh, we had to have a growth story, and that growth story was very much about um, the, developing those commercial, commercial cattle numbers, um, building scale, but leveraging off something that was very valuable um, in terms of genetics. Um, the way we did things, um, we, we decided there was real value in all of our strategies that we put together over that period of time. And that was things like, you know, multi-locations, so um, mitigating against risk, um, we had a depth of intellectual property that we thought had had real value, and we didn't want to lose that uh, by us exiting exiting the um, the enterprise. So we wanted that continuity of the the intellectual property, and we had this thing that you know it was very hard to describe, but it was culture. I, I, I suppose that you know it was strong safety culture, but it was also a very strong people business. And so when you sort of look at those things independently, it probably doesn't mean a lot, but for us, when we integrated that, it was a business that we could sort of say, well, um, you know, this business is is passionate, um, but it's also safe. It's got it's got value in it as well, and um, that was something that took a long time for us to actually identify what those values were. Mm. So then, to the second question, you must expect from investors, which was, how much money do you want, and what are you going to do with it? How did you get New Zealand Super comfortable with your that your plans made sense? Was it just about building your capabilities, or were you also looking to acquire capabilities? It's a little bit of both for us. Um, the scale of you know where we were at back in 2017 uh, was not overly um, attractive to to most investors. Um, you know in this in this in this space. Investors we were talking to were, you know, more used to sort of large um, enterprises that had already been established where value chains were in play, um, you know, where there was scale that, um, you know, was corporate scale. We were a family business that said to an investor, um, help us build it, come on the journey with us, um, use our capabilities and we'll get some capability um, from you in terms of uh, modelling and investment sort of criteria and and good financial management that will help us both get to where we want to go. Uh, you don't do that with banks. You don't do that with debt finance. Um, you, 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 you tell your bank that you've got those capabilities already and that you just want the money. This is a different deal. When you, when you take on an investor, you've got to decide what it is you want from that investor. For us, yes, it was partnering in terms of that investment um, and finance dollar, but it was more about if we are going to grow, we're going to need some skills that we don't have already. Um, we took, we um, developed a structure where we'd never had an advisory board or a um, board of directors before. And, you know, we, the first thing we had to do, obviously, um, was develop the skills on that board, you know, digging into a matrix and, and making sure that we had everything covered to get us to that next stage. And we looked at it in in sort of stages as well. It was kind of that transition stage where we, you know, we start to get our processes and whatever in, in place, but you know, then there's the next growth stage that really has you humming like a corporate. So you actually have to have structures that, um, that are well and truly accepted to, to corporate investors. Um, so I guess you know, that, that's where we started. We started with the dream, the vision, the, the, uh, the growth story. 
and then had to go and, and find an investor that suited or aligned with those, those visions. So to the third question then, what does the investor get? What did New Zealand Super get when they invested in your business? And this is going to be different for, for different investment sort of circumstances. For us, it was um, investment in you know, the land assets, obviously, in the cattle assets and in the in the IP. And that, that had, as I said before, a great deal of value. Um, New Zealand also got the people. Um, it got a functioning, um, you know, not too badly functioning um, group of people who, who seemed to sort of know how to operate um, what, they, what they had. So very much about, um, yes, bringing in capital to grow, but the initial investment was really, they were buying capability. Um, they weren't buying land assets alone and um, you know, developing their own management uh, within there. They wanted the management and it's, um, it's been a nice partnership because of that, because there's respect on either side, uh, but that management really did have some value. And where did capital appreciation and yield? How, yeah. how did that? So, yes. yes. So looking at the, at the financials, um, you know, and that's an, another thing, you've got to actually understand what the investor is looking for. Are they looking for just long-term capital? Are they looking for yield or a bit of both? And in our case, it was both. Um, we had an, a functioning um, livestock enterprise that was continuing, uh, had to continue to be profitable. And then land appreciation is important to any investor in the long, longer term. And our investor was uh, a long-term thinking uh, timeline investor. We knew that um, we had to demonstrate that uh, you know, return on investment was acceptable to them. Um, and that generally is on a sort of a, you know, over a couple of years rather than a year on year. Um, as you can imagine, as you know, livestock um, is a very difficult um, asset to, or commodity to, to demonstrate um, profitability uh, every single year um, on, a, on a 12 monthly. And I think, you know, they understood that. Um, it's, it's different if they were just looking at um, value adding or um, buying assets that didn't have that capital base. That was, you know, for, for most long-term investors, that's an absolute must. Um, and I guess we had a, a track record of being um, to show and demonstrate that we could, um, we could uh, achieve that capital appreciation as well as the yield. And was it weighted to one or the other? If it was, we didn't know. Um, no. uh, we, and, and you can't produce modelling to make it fit an investor's um, requirements. Mm -hmm. And that's a really dangerous place to try to, to, try to make it match. Um, I think that, you know, the glorious thing about our investment was we didn't actually understand what their hurdles were, what the, you know, what, what they had to achieve. And that was, um, you know, that ignorance was actually very good because all we did was present what we knew and um, modelled up historical uh, financials we knew we could, could achieve. Now, when you scale that up, that changes somewhat, but historical um, financials really do guide what you can do. So not knowing that was actually a benefit, I think, for us, because we weren't then trying to make those, those numbers match. Um, it was up to them to say, well, this is what we're after. Yeah. yeah. So then to the fourth question that you must expect an investor to ask, when, when does the investor get the money back? New Zealand Super is a long-term investor in agriculture. I understand their investment time frame is more 30 years plus. So what was their thinking on getting their money back from investing in Pelgro? No doubt, um, you know, yield is still very important to them. Um, you know, we, they do look for yield and within their investment portfolio, you know, obviously a superannuation fund has yield and capital growth. The fact that this was a business that could provide both, I think there was, um, there was no pressure to outperform the market. Um, and so knowing that those long-term capital gain benefits were going to come because that's the nature of agriculture over 30 years, um, I guess there, there was sort of a, an understanding that, um, you know, there was less pressure perhaps on that yield in the short term. That's not the case with uh, capital, uh, private equity capital, but it is um, very much, I guess, why we positioned ourselves with someone like a superannuation because in our um, experience, you know, agriculture just sits so neatly um, in, this, in this portfolio sort of area. 
and maybe they, you know, we're uh, alternate capital, <laughs> alternate investment. So uh, for them, we're a small part of what they do um, in their investment portfolio. So the highs and lows don't affect them at all, um, but they look in a long-term view and, and it was just such an alignment for us mm -hmm. to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Bruce, some of the people listening today may be looking for an investor that eventually then uh, they buy that investor out. But in your case, it, it was the opposite, was it not? It's very much a decision you have to be careful with right at the start. Um, talk to all of your stakeholders to make sure you understand what it is you want. You don't want to be um, partnered with an investor who expects you to stay there for 10 years and you want to be out in two mm -hmm. or not be in there at all. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's almost the first hurdle you have to get um, get past before you actually go looking because it's it's one of the early decisions you'll have to make um, when you exit because, um, you know, we know that we won't be here for the next 30 years. We'd be extremely old. <laughs> and, uh, so we know that, it, you know, at one point uh, we will exit. But that that has to be uh, very much, um, that's part of your initial discussions that you're having anyway. That's the thing that builds the trust, understanding what the other person or the other um, the other company wants. And it's just, um, and circumstances change, of course, but unless you have that vision that you either want to be in or you want to be out or you want to be half in or half out, right at the start, you, you really, um, you're not true to yourself or to the investor. Yes. Yeah. So if we can stay with the first webinar, um, in that webinar, there were four key documents that were highlighted that you would need to help answer investor, the investor questions. They were strategy document, business plan, financial model, and valuation. Pro to help us gain further insights into Pelgro, I wonder if you can just take us through some of the elements of your strategy document. In particular, what were your strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, it, it's a it's a bit of a nasal ga navel gazing exercise, and it's pretty tough um, for someone who's been in business for a long time to actually identify that you do have strengths and weaknesses, and um, sometimes it balances out. For us, um, if we, we weren't large landholders. We didn't have extensive, um, massive, uh, you know, acres of land uh, that we had to offer to an investor. Uh, what we did have is really high quality assets, land assets, strategically bought over the years to, you know, de-risk um, season and climate and whatever. So um, I guess we had that, but what we did have is we had the soft assets, um, that, you know, those soft things like we had integrity and that was just when we talked to investors that was almost a number one thing because that brought the trust um, we had a reputation in industry that was important so those soft assets I think people shouldn't um, disregard those it's it's not all about the financials um, you can change the way you do things to actually meet your financial expectations but you can never change things like integrity and, and reputation um, we had a very clear vision of what the growth strategy was. Um, we had a passion for it too. It was it was something that we talked and thought about for for a long time, but just weren't quite sure how we were going to get there. Um, we had a, a wonderful um, business, which seed stock is is genetics, of course, and and it's um you know it's generational. Um, it's something very real. It's something that can add value. So we knew we had that. We just had to scale that up, and rather. Um, than looking to scale seed stock up, we said, well, let's leverage um, the commercial cattle enterprise off that and actually get value for our commercial cattle in the market because of our, our seed stock brand. So that, that's kind of what the story was. Um, we, we broke it up a little bit in terms of um, there was land asset that we knew was highly valuable to, a, to a, um, an investor going forward and acquiring, acquiring more. The people was the other thing, um, you know, Apart from the cattle, but the people was it, it was an important part because you had skilled management in there. Um, you had processes and, and you know procedures and systems and already established and built, and that was attractive to an investor because to start from scratch and do that um, without that sort of continuity um, is really very difficult. And so all of our staff came across. Um, 
and it was it was sort of a you know it was an established business long reputation of um, you know I guess integrity and all of that and it actually when you when you build the picture um, we were surprised what you know really what was of interest and uh, attractive to the investors that we would have probably just thought oh well, that's just the way we do things um, it was so you know I guess that that financial part of it um, was very much front and centre but all of those other things really played a part and so the growth story was very much taking your genetics buying quality land assets and building a genetic uh, a commercial herd mm. that benefited from those superior genetics correct and we you know long known that our clients were benefiting and that was wonderful but we wanted an opportunity as well to be actually to be able to um, integrate some of um, our, our clients product into something that we do ourselves as well and uh, we'd never had that opportunity because we just never mm. um, had the scale to do it and um, hopefully we're on our way to doing that now. Mm -hmm. So what about your weaknesses? Oh gosh, so many. <laughs> um, I, I think when you, you know, when you're looking, um, looking at uh, getting an investor on board, you kind of need to be very honest with yourself about what those weaknesses are. Um, we saw ourselves as quite a large scale operator. Um, in the whole scheme of things, we are not, or we were, we were not. Uh, and once we sort of faced that, um, that's when the growth story became the important part of it. Um, yes, you are this size um, at the beginning of the trans transition, um, but this is where we're scaling up to, and this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to answer all of those questions that you've got. Um, and, and I think once we learned that that was just as valuable, that became a strength because not everybody wants to take on a business that's operating as is and uh, without somewhere to go. Um, and, and I think if, if you're an investor, you've got to think, well, um, you know, the benefits have to be either long term or short term. And, and if they're short term, my goodness, you've got to have enormous um, uh, revenue numbers and, uh, you know, and profitability. Mm -hmm. If you're a bit longer term, you've got to have that strategy to get you to, you know, 10, 20 or whatever years um, in terms of capital gain. So um, scale didn't then become an issue, become an issue as we worked on that growth strategy. Um, the other thing was, you know, you've, you've got to have that succession. You've got to understand um, what the future looks like, where you sit in that in that business. And that took us an awful lot. Um, and, and the, you know, we did hear it a number of times from potential investors, well, you've got two key personnel in your business or three um, if we include some of our other staff, but that's a real risk to an investor because uh, if we decide to, to go without um, proper succession in place, um, you know, their, their investment is at risk. So that was another key thing. We had to actually work out how, how we do exit the, the business and exit in such a way that it, it didn't um, create a, a risk for the investor. And of course, we heard that same old thing, commodities, agriculture, um, Australian uh, climate. Um, we heard that over and over again. And I think, you know, if someone in, in the investment space doesn't understand Australian ag, you really are wasting your time um, trying to beat down the door because if they don't get that, they're not going to get your business. Um, so that cuts out a lot of investors anyway, um, who don't understand the highs and lows of, um, of Australian ag. Yeah. And I've seen a chart of um, variability of rainfall by country, and uh, Australia um, takes first prize. <laughs> if we can turn then um, to what's required to be investor ready, in the second webinar, uh, Denny Olson gave us a blueprint for what was required. I'm just wondering if you can um, talk through the cornerstone elements of Palga Grove's investment readiness. Mm, I, it, it was so many parts to it. Um, it's really difficult to sort of, you know, break it down into a couple. But for example, the strategic plan, as I said before, you've got to have that vision. You start with the, the vision and then you go to people who can help you sort of produce what's required to, to demonstrate that vision. And we went straight to our... Um, to a, an advisory um, accountant, BDO, thank you, um, who, um, who who helped to break it down and, and they understood what those investors were looking for too. Um, that helped us to sort of piece together, um, you know, that documentation that we, we required. And of course you need an investment, uh, an information memorandum. And that has to be not just a nice story. It has to be, you know, 
triggered by what the investor is looking for. Um, we went about trying to upskill ourselves and, and every meeting we went to, and there were a lot, um, with advisors or with, um, you know, any, anyone we could find to help us to understand corporate agriculture. Um, we would go with questions always. Um, we tried to understand the corporate, um, the corporate ag people in the space already and what were their, um, what were their risks, what, what did we need to know that they were doing, that we should be doing. Um, and, and also we sort of started to trend the commodity cycles and, and look at a more macro um, sort of view of the world, which we never really had to do before because our market was very simple. We understood our market. Um, it didn't change much and we could control um, that up or down. When you start to look at, at you know, corporate investment, um, they do look at the mega trends or the, um, the, the emerging risks a lot more um, and they are going to be affected by those because they've got somebody they have to report to within their organisation as well. So we started to understand what their touch points were. Um, then we looked at the, um, you know, that, that financial modelling. Uh, we, we sort of worked on a 10 year period um, because we felt that that could give a true picture of what our investment would look like. And that was a, um, that was a you know, a turning point for us that we actually, um, even if we didn't find an, an investor, having that knowledge just helped us to make better decisions anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you just go um, armed with knowledge um, to, to anyone who will listen to you and answer your question. Mm -hmm. And what, what about the structure? Had that, what was that journey in terms of getting, having a structure that could attract, mm -hmm. be attractive to yeah. an investor? Well, most family operations, of course, have um, you know either a trust or a company, or and then uh, may or may not have different entities owning the land. And we had a, a fairly simple model, but we knew that it would have to be changed um, for an investor because of you know whatever their uh, compliance requirements, particularly overseas investors. So we had to then say, well, is our structure um, investor ready for um, a broad range of investors? And we sort of decided it wasn't and had to go about um, getting that set up um, so that it could be sort of easily, so that shareholdings or whatever could be easily transferred. And that's the time you're having conversations with your children or, you know, whoever your stakeholders are um, in, in your agricultural um, entity. And, you know, you really have to have some difficult questions. And that, that comes to, you know, agreeing with your investor what they want out of your business too. And until you know that, it's very difficult to actually have your structure right. Yeah. So I guess, you know, we got great advice about what the broad, um, the, you know, the more general types of structures should look like or would look like. And then once we got the investment um, green light, then we put in place those um, additional things like meat and whatever. So what was the general structure? Put all your hard assets, land in one entity and yeah. operating high risk in another entity? Yes, and, and look, a lot of it had to do with the investors, um, you know, established structures as well and how they had to do um, do their processes. But for us, it was, yes, obviously separating land, people and cattle um, with IP and the cattle. So, but of course, that's where the IP sits with us. So, yeah, that was pretty interesting. Um, and, you know, it, it's really quite an easy structure to operate under once you understand it all. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and we've talked a little bit about people, but, but just I mean, if you can just go through it a little bit more in terms of what's required. Mm, I think the people, you know, when we run businesses, we forget the value of people. And, and it wasn't until we started talking to investors that they wanted the guarantee that not only us as senior managers came with the investment, but also the, the established staffing, um, you know, we'd selected some fabulous staff over the years and, and I think we had a sort of a, um, you know, situation where staff wanted to come to us because um, they could learn certain things from us. And so that was actually fairly valuable. Um, we started to sort of then think about the governance of how this looks. Um, you know, we needed some skills to be brought into the board, um, particularly the finance um, the finance side, um, which we did, and then we needed good governance, um, a chairman who, who was well experienced in, um, in governance. So because you've got two partners basically with different backgrounds, different cultures, different um, 
understandings of what they wanted out of out of an investment. Um, so for us, as you know, remaining in the in the partnership, we wanted certain things, and the uh, the institution would of course want certain things. So we had to come up with a structure that actually worked, um, you know, for both of us. Um, so we used to sort of, I guess, before the investor came along, we'd set ourselves up to to kind of understand those corporate. Um, the way that corporates set up their units or business units or, or business departments and started to sort of think very much in, in clusters of those sorts of things. And when you're a husband and wife running a, um, uh, a livestock operation, that doesn't sort of sit with, you know, you, you do your husband's job and he does your job most of the time. So we have to really think about those and, and, and where they may sit after a successful investment. Um, and that, that, you know, that was very much with the whole team. Um, to come to terms with that so it wouldn't be such a shock when we did change change to a new enterprise. Mm -hmm. And what about processes? Yeah, very much. Um, you know, most family farmers um, are blissfully unaware of, of some of the compliance that we have to, um, and, and the liabilities, particularly around WH&S and, and employment, um, HR entitlements, making sure that um, you're not on the front page of, um, of the newspaper for underpaying staff or, you know, it's things like that that you probably take for granted that if you offer someone a, you know amount of money to come and work for you, they'd be happy with it, you're happy with it. Well, actually, you're underpaying them because of the hours they work. So most of us um, didn't sort of see that as a priority risk. Uh, certainly when an institution comes on board, um, those sorts of compliance and regulatory uh, parts of your business are increasingly important, very important. Yeah, risk is number one. So you're all investment ready. Um, how did you go about selecting the um, perfect investor? It's obviously not an easy journey, not a straight road, but you got there in the end. How did you do it? Mm, it certainly didn't happen in weeks or months. It, it was years. From the time that we decided this was the direction we wanted to take, um, then we had to actually work out what type of investor, and that's not a really easy um, thing to do because uh, you know, there's so many out there. There's, there's family offices and private equity and institutions and, and individual people. You know, there's, there's entrepreneurs and business people all over the place who want to invest in agriculture, but they want to invest um, in a different way than owning um, directly themselves. So kind of was a, um, and always, we always say this kind of a bit of a roller coaster. But also a dance, you know, you've got to find that partner and have a little bit of a, you know, waltz around the room with them and then um, decide if they're, they're going to stay, stick. Um, we did a lot of travel. We, we talked to a lot of government trade and um, we went on all sorts of um, trade missions and um, investment missions overseas. Um, we were really out of our comfort zone because uh, uh, a lot of those established um, Companies who were on those trips with us, you know, had had, I guess they were corporates, but just looking for more um, for more investment. So we were really out of our comfort zone. We did have a couple of quite interesting sort of um, um, quite interesting meetings, and you know, we we knew almost immediately that it was not for us. But how do we get out of this office <laughs> politely? <laughs> yeah, and run, run for the door, and um, you know, we woke up a few times. We came very close um, on one private equity deal, and we woke up one in the middle of the night, sort of you know, together, and just what are we do? what no, what are we doing? And phone the next morning, just said, look, it's not for us, and so things like that. And and you know, we knew that we were a long term business that needed that long term sustainability. Someone who was going to treat our land and people and cattle properly because they were our values. And so to align with someone who was also looking for that same thing, it is like a maze. You just have to, patience is, everyone keeps them, you know, have patience. Um, and it really takes a lot of patience because you, you, you can't rush into it. If it's the wrong investor, you're going to have a really nasty few years ahead of you. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, if you think of the smoggest board of investments that these investment committees um, in superannuation funds, for example, have on their desk or come across their desk every day. It's quite astounding um, how they found us. It is actually quite astounding because you're, the likelihood of you being picked up by that super fund, um, being the right place, the right time, the right uh, people, the right everything, is, is quite, that was quite 
um, yeah, quite a unique experience, I suppose, because of, of what we've seen of so many of the wrong type of investor mm -hmm. um, that when we sort of finally did find the right one, it was it was quite miraculous. Mm -hmm. So, so New Zealand's at your door. What what was the process you went through? in terms of satisfying yourself that they were the right mm. investor? Well, I think we did look, um, certainly independent advice is your best friend. Someone who is on your side, yes, it's exciting and thrilling um, to find an investor finally after such a long time, but you've actually got to make sure that all the boxes tick. Um, is this actually what you want? Is it, is it um, designed for your benefit as well as the investor's benefit? Because at the end of the day, you know, if you're leaving equity in there, there's some risk involved in you getting that out and whatever. So legal and tax and um, financial advice were just key. Um, so then you do the, the, you know, once again, that sort of give and take, um, and it does take time um, of getting the legalities right, getting the agreed things right. Um, you can agree things in principle and then suddenly when you put it, um, you know, into a legal document, it looks a lot different to what you thought. So. Um, and that's building trust. Every one of those meetings we had, certainly with New Zealand Super, but we were building trust on both sides. So um, there is never a good agreement where one party gets everything they want. Um, it's never going to be a good outcome. So that was very much top of mind for us, um, that there would be compromise and there would be give and take. And that is the same in any good relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's now almost um, three years since New Zealand Super in, invested in Pal Palbro. What's been the post-match summary? Yeah, for us, it's been a changed environment um, in terms of, I, I think the vision has only been strengthened, which has been very exciting for us. Um, of course, we've made a number of acquisitions and, and grown the business since that time. Um, but for us, it was kind of that, um, adjustment to reporting, which is you know, quarterly, monthly, um, annually. Um, the fact that we were not making decisions ourselves was probably the hardest thing to, to sort of come to terms with initially. Um, we, I think we've gone well beyond that now and we're, we're in a really comfortable space, but it does take time. And I think what we did understand that, thank goodness, we hadn't rushed into the private equity for us, um, that we had this long-term investment partner that actually we really liked. <laughs> we really liked the people. Um, we understood and came to terms with that high level of best practice compliance and, um, you know, everything had to be done just a little bit, a little step better than um, everyone else mm -hmm. um, because for any institution, they don't want to see their name associated with a business that was, you know, either criticised for bad animal welfare um, treatment or, um, you know, underpayment of staff or anything like that. So it's it's a business that has to keep um, that little bit above the standards that, you know, probably the rest of um, us as private uh, companies would sit at because you're a target and, and the bigger you are or the bigger you get, um, the more likely you are to attract, um, you know, that sort of oversight. Um, we, we kind of made sure that we had the skills in place and we've been building those um, ever since. The skills in place to make sure that A, the reporting was, was good, but B, that our strategic plan could be achieved. And, and um, you know, there's not one or two people can do that. When you grow, you have to actually have some expertise brought in, which we have done. And I think we're in a really nice place now where we've got all of those bases covered, ready for that next um, scalability. And, and, and it is, it's all sitting there. It's it's um, um it's it's had to be grown, and I know it's almost three years. But the first twelve months is really just a um, whoa. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what we're doing. No, no, we're not sure what you're doing either. Um, but it is a it's a it's a growth of um, understanding what your responsibilities are, and and also I mean the, at the end of the day you're still running, you're trying to run a business, mm -hmm. so it is a, it's an added level of. Um, uh, on top of what you would ordinarily be doing. But, you know, at the end of the day, why did we start the journey? Well, we started the journey to achieve this growth strategy and see our vision coming to, into reality. And that's, that's what we've done. And it's, that's the exciting part of it. So what about your exit? 
Yeah, well, it's no secret. Um, David and I, my husband and I, have, have, um, we'll be leaving um, mid-year this year as executive. Um, we'll continue on it on the board of directors, and um, of course, we'll keep we'll be, we'll be continuing on with our um, equity relationship with with New Zealand Super. But we saw it as a time of um, uh, the growth is really just happening and, and underway. We think the skills required in this next stage are skills that we perhaps, you know, don't have. And it's always that thing that um, I think you've got to be a big enough person to say, well, um, it's now time for someone else to, to actually take this and run with it, um, you know, keep the vision, um, but let's have that, that, that impact as a, um, as, an, as a director rather than actually working um, daily in the business. And um, I think it'll be a I think it'll be a really exciting sort of next few years for us. So you get to continue to watch the the business from the boardroom. Absolutely, but you know, not to say that we won't be at every bull sale still, and uh, you know, and and absolute um, you know interest in in everything that uh, and and the difficult years to take our nose out of the operations. Uh, and so that'll be our next our next change for us is to sort of, you know make sure that we allow that next um, executive to, to take that and run with it. Prue, mm -hmm. you have a remarkable investment ready story to tell. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Congratulations again on all your achievements. Working as I do in private business, I know how important it is for owners to have the confidence that when they do ride out, out into the sunset, not that you're quite doing that yet, <laughs> that the business will continue to prosper long after you're gone. Must be enormously satisfying for you and David, knowing that this will be the case with New Zealand Super as an owner. Prue and I are happy to take questions, but um, while we're, people are organising their questions, um, Sarah, um, you might like to um, say a few words. Sure, thanks Margot. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come through on the chat, I just want to say thank you so much Margot and Prue for taking the time today to take us through the investor readiness journey. I think it um, is a really nice summary of the first two webinars and it really gives us such a good understanding of how that process was applied in your journey and it sounds like extremely successfully and you're quite happy with the result which is amazing. Um, as mentioned earlier, these this webinar and the two prior webinars can be found on the BDO website or the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Developments website should you want to refer to them later. Uh, we also mentioned the masterclasses which are um, still to be confirmed uh, with some of the disruptions so we will be in contact and keep an eye out for those. If you do want any further information or have any questions about the program please feel free to reach out either to myself or the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, happy to um, answer anything that you have questions on. Um, Margot, I'll hand it back to you whether we've got any questions or not. If not, we yeah, can we just, wrap it we've up. We've just got one question, Prue. How long, did, you said it took a long time, but how long was the whole investment? That's a really good one. <laughs> You'd think it would be an easy question to answer, but it, it, it ended up being about, and I don't want to frighten anyone here, but it ended up being about four years. Yeah. And that was from start to finish. That was from um, piecing together our own strategy in our mind as to what we wanted to do and actually taking that time to then um, decide that it wasn't bank finance that was going to get us there. It was going to have to be, um, you know, capital funding from somewhere else or an equity partner. So that was... Yeah, that, that was probably the longest part of it. Well, here we are, this tiny little, you know, people you know, sitting on our farm here. Um, how would we ever in, have invite a, an investor in that laugh at us? And so, um, yeah, I guess it was four years from the time we started thinking yeah. about that and actually the reality of this is what we're going to do. Right. Uh, did you ever consider not going through the process once you started? once you'd started did mm. you did you look to mail at any point um i think i'm going to say no we didn't um we we the process um frustrated us a lot um because we used to come home from meetings and sort of say well why don't people get it why don't they understand it and 
maybe that was part of, we hadn't come up with the right investor, but also it could have been part of us not actually, um, you know, producing something that people could understand. And we're not really quite sure what that was, but I think the length of time that it took, um, and, and then there's the ones that you did get that, that agreement and then you found out that it wasn't the right party. So, you know, that there was a lot of frustration. We kept saying to ourselves, look, we'll give it another six months and see how it goes. And um, um, that was kind of, you know, really within a month of that saying that um, we'd arranged with New Zealand Super to start to discuss, you know, and that takes a long time too. You know, that process was really quite long. But I don't think at any point we said, um, this is the wrong thing to do because we just had such confidence in, in what the outcome could be that we couldn't believe that someone else couldn't see that too. And, and that's a bit, you know, that sounds a bit, um, you know, ridiculous, I suppose, when I look at it now. But um, if you don't have that real vision yourself or that actual, we can do this, well, no one else is going to believe in you either. So um, that was very much part of um, not giving up. And, and what would happen is a fresh, a fresh, you know, we'd get a fresh look at it from, um, you know, a country or an area or whatever um, where we hadn't, um, heard from before and um, and that was everyone from family offices and, and looking at it we could have worked very happily with family off you know with with those sorts of investors um, I think and now we see more and more of them in agriculture it's very exciting you know Twiggy mm -hmm. Forest and and Gina Reinhardt and the like and um, you know really getting their hands into ag particularly livestock um, that they must get something that we got back then. So that, that's really exciting for us, those family officers sort of, you know, um, coming on board to what is traditionally, um, you know, just a, a family farming type operation. And, and if you're not a family farmer, you're a corporate. So for us, we were somewhere in between. Um, so it's really exciting to see some of those now coming on board. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have no further questions. So I'd, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today and uh, and hope you've um, gained some insights.